So we left yesterday in a very exciting cliffhanger where we were uh, about to compute a limit. And so this was the limit, which uh, let me remind you, if you if you try making t equal zero, which you should always do because uh, it's the easiest thing, and if it works, then you're done. It's very low risk, high reward. Uh, you got square root of zero plus nine minus three divided by zero. So that is three minus three divided by zero. So that is zero divided by zero. Uh, so I'm sad. I don't know what. I mean, I'm getting nothing from there. So, um, um, so when this happens, basically the only tool at our disposal is to try to try to simplify stuff and hope for the best. And like I said yesterday, I have no surefire way that it's gonna. I have no recipe. No one has a recipe to compute every limit. Pretty sure it doesn't exist. Um, but we can. That doesn't stop us from trying. So um, I already we already got an idea yesterday, which was I see a square root added to a thing. When I see a square root added to a thing, I like to make the square root go away by uh, multiplying by the conjugate. I think you usually call it the conjugate. So if I see, if I see square root of some stuff plus some other stuff, it makes me want to multiply by the square root of the same thing minus the stuff inside of the square root with a Hey, you're no, muted. You. I just got, thank you. I just got kicked out of the meeting, didn't I? Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, that's just great. Uh, oh. What the hell did I do to deserve that? I think your internet might have crashed. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's probably why. Okay. Well, let's hope it doesn't happen again. Um, otherwise, we could have a live stream of me calling um, the internet company. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. That would be hilarious. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, I was saying, so it crashed 10 seconds ago, right? Did you miss stuff? Yeah, we didn't see that. Whatever the second line is, we missed that. Oh, okay. So let me, so what I was saying is that when I see square root uh, plus something else, oh, so I think my internet has been going for a while. If I see a square root added to something, it makes me want to multiply by the same thing, but with a minus sign instead. Or if I see a minus sign, it makes me want to put a, a plus sign because then I get no square root because when you multiply a sum uh, times the difference, you get the difference of squares because, um, I mean, I hate when you say FOIL, but feel free to FOIL. Uh, this is the distributive law. Um, this is A plus B times A minus A plus B times B. Uh, and then 
distributive law again so that this is a b minus, minus b squared and now these two things cancel i get a squared minus b squared i mean i really hold this ring to bell so um if a was the square root of something then there's going to be no square root at the end of it that's probably that's nice so um of course i can't just multiply by whatever i want because then i mean i can but if i go like this and this is just a different function uh so i can compute the limit of this but it's saying nothing about the original problem but on the other hand if i divide by the same thing again now i've multiplied by one and i know that multiplying by one is multiplying by one is okay i don't do anything so if if this um if i find the limit of the thing on the the bottom if i find the limit of this thing that's gonna uh that's gonna be the same as the limit of this thing because i get one from the other by multiplying by one i'm paranoid So, um, okay, so in the numerator, so now let's simplify this. In the numerator, we have uh, some times a difference, which is what I was going for. When in doubt, put more brackets. I have a sum times a difference, so that's going to be a difference of squares. The one that changes sign is the one that gets the minus sign. And the denominator, I can, let's not do anything. So, uh, the numerator simplifies because I have a square root squared and when you square a square root, you get the original number. That's why you call it square root. And I have, and then the nines cancel. So I have t squared divided by t, which is just great. Um, because if t is not zero, I can cancel one of the t's in the numerator with one of the t's in the denominator because they're both multiplying everything. Oh yeah, t squared. Thank you, Sydney. Thank you so much. Um, okay. So that means that my connection is working and also at least one of you is awake. Yeah, um, okay, I copied it wrong. Um, this is supposed to be this. So, um, there's a t squared everywhere. Okay, so I have t squared in the numerator and the denominator. So now two t's cancel and I get one divided by root of t squared plus nine plus three. And that's pretty good news um, because um, I'm pretty sure I can do that limit root of t squared plus nine minus three divided by t squared. Well, since they're equal, if t is not zero, then the, their limits are the same. So this is the limit of one divided by root of t squared plus nine plus three. And I can do this limit uh, because, well, <clears throat> applying a lot, applying a limit law for the power and then for the sum and then for the roots and then for the sum. But the thing is, when when I plug a when I plug in t equals zero here, um, I get I get six. So I don't get zero, that's what's important. Now, 
next next section we will see easy way to justify this. So I can plug this in. I get square root of uh, sorry one over three plus three, and that is one six, and that's the limit. <coughs> I graphed this function the other day, and let me graph it again. Plus nine divided by x squared minus three. And remember that when I zoomed in a lot, it started to look. So I'm zooming in around t equals x equals zero. It started. I mean, it looked like I was approaching one sixth. One sixth is point one six six six. But then, as you get really close, um, you would start seeing these nasty oscillations. Turns out that that's a rounding error because we just did the limit um, and it does approach one six. So, so um, the computer lied to us and now we know for sure. <clears throat> okay. Um, okay, are there any questions? How do you get one in the numerator? Uh, I assume so. Do you mean? I assume you mean here, which is the first time I got one in the numerator. Well, um, I had. Let me go to the next slide. So what I have is t squared. So just copying that in the next slide. This is the, the function that I have. So the thing is, let me do it carefully. This is t squared times one, because that's just always true. And uh, Fractions um, stood like this. When you cancel something that's multiplying, you don't get zeros, you get ones. And now uh, this is one, so I can just ignore it, and I'm left with a uh, one in the numerator. Was that the question? Okay, so um, those were some, I mean, I'm going to give you two examples of limits, but I mean, the way you learn is to, when you do a lot of limits, um, so basically there's some things you can try and after, but the, but the way you do it is just to guess. Um, how do you know if you can do a thing, you try to do it, and if it works, and if you don't make algebra mistakes in between, which might be the hardest part, um, then then you're done. And if you don't, then you try something else. Eventually, once you do enough problems, um, you know, if you go through the book and you see the 100 limits that are there, you start getting, uh, you start getting good at guessing what you're supposed to do for each limit. But that's really all there is to it. Um, I mean, in the future, in a couple of weeks, we'll see some other tools to compute limits. Um, like we can do it using a derivative, we can compute some limits uh, easier. Can you use L'Hopital rule too? Well, um, we don't know what that is yet. So, I mean, in principle, you can. Uh, but I would I would wait till we see it. 
because when I've seen when I've seen people try to use L'Hopital rule from their from memory, it usually doesn't work well for them. <clears throat> Eventually, we we'll learn L'Hopital rule. So, um, okay, um, another example. The limit as um, everyone's favorite example, the limit of the absolute value. So, what the hell is the absolute value? Is the is the question we always have. The absolute value is um, well, it takes a number, and if it's positive, so if it's positive or zero, it gives me the same number, uh, and. If it's negative, it forgets the sign. Oh. So how do you forget if you have a negative number, how do you get a positive number? You take its opposite. So for example, the absolute value of what the the absolute value of two, I would look up, uh, since two is positive, I would look at it in this row, and it's two. And here, if I wanted the absolute value of negative one, I would say it's negative, so I have to look in the second row. And then it's negative x, x is negative one, so it's positive one. So uh, the absolute value, well, Graphs are always useful. Uh, so this is y equals x, um, and that's why it looks like on the positive numbers. And this is y equals negative x, which is why it, why it looks like in the negative numbers. So altogether, this is the graph of the absolute value. Um, so, um, You know how to graph this because you remember probably how to graph lines. Um, you have the equation looks like m mx plus b, and then was the slope. So this one, for example, has slope one. This one has slope negative one, and the intercept is zero. zero so it goes to the origin. Okay. So um, this graph is basically two halves. I mean, stitched together. So why don't I use that to compute the limit? Um, what I should do, write that down. Since the graph, is made up to half. Two halves. Let's um, work on each half separately. So there's a way to do that that we've already talked about, which is um, to use limits on on, what, on on the right and on the left. So remember that the limit, uh, the limit of a function exists if both uh, one-sided limits exist and they're equal. So if I do this, if I do both of them, I'm going to get the answer because if they're not equal or they don't exist, uh, there's going to be no answer. And if they're equal, then that's going to be the answer. So why is the limit of um, of the absolute value of x from the right easier than just the limit of the absolute value? Well, the reason is that I'm approaching I'm approaching zero from the right. So that means that x is positive. And for a positive number, the absolute value is just the original number. So really here I can this is the exact same thing. 
as as the the function y equals x. So here's the function y equals x. It's exactly the same line, except that it's a line. It never turns. So if I'm approaching if I'm approaching these points down here, it shouldn't matter if I take the blue path or the black path as long as I'm coming from the right um, because they're the exact same path. So, um, so I know how to do this. I mean, this was literally one of the limit laws. I just plug in zero. So this limit is zero. Uh, and now, and that's it. So if the limit on the other side is zero, that means that we're that the limit is zero. If it's not, then it doesn't exist. Then either way, we're done. So what's the limit when x approaches zero from the left? Well, same thing. If x um, so if we're approaching zero from the left, that means that x is smaller than zero. And if x is smaller than zero, the absolute value, I look in here, and it's the opposite of the number. So um, that's the limit as x approaches zero from the left of negative x. And this limit, also by limit loss, I can pull the negative one outside. So it's negative one times the limit of x. And that is negative one times zero. And that is just zero. So, uh, so we're done. Both limits are equal. So, um, the limit, so the limit exists, it's equal to both of these limits. And that's it. Are there any questions? Where did you get the negative one from? Um, well, from here. Here, uh, this is negative x is negative one times x. And I just took the negative one from inside the limit and I put it outside. So the limit of negative one times x is negative one times the limit of x. And this is negative x. Uh, what is the limit law called again that you use on like the first one is like x was approaching zero from the right? Oh, that one didn't have a name. It's the one that tells you the limit of x. At least in the book didn't have a name. I'm not gonna make up a name now. So like, um, so what does it mean exactly then? The limit, so that, that limit, wait, Cindy, did I answer your question? Before, sorry, uh, that's the, okay. Um, so that limit law just said that if you take the limit of the function x as x approaches anything, we get that anything. Uh, if x is approaching two, then what is x approaching? Well, it's approaching two. That's, that's all it says, uh, has no name. I mean, for example, this is something that people use without explaining what I use, because normally it's the kind of thing that is clear from context normally. 
So this is just a two-sided um, limit, right? Yeah, I mean, all limits are two-sided limits, but this is a limit where I decided to compute the two sides separately. And that tends to be useful because how do you make interesting limit problems? Um, because most limits are just very easy. Um, you just plug in the number and you get the correct answer. Um, but the thing is, uh, we're not gonna ask you, you never try to do the really easy ones because that's kind of pointless. These are the hard ones. And you, you get hard ones from managing the nominators, strange things like, like the logarithm approaching zero or um, what else? Um, and functions define on two sides differently. And then you have to see if they agree in the middle. Like, so let's see, let's see this example then. So this is a thing you see, you see pretty commonly. So this is the function that is uh, three when x is smaller than zero. Um, Functions that oh, it's slide. So uh, a lot of um, a typical problem involving limits is um, try to find the limit of a function defined like this. Um, because when functions look simple, they, the limits tend to be easy, basically. So um, if I see this problem, so to the left of three. Um, to the left of three, I have a definition. To the right of three, I have a different one. Um, so I'm gonna wanna use, um, compute the, the one-sided limit to compute both of them and see what happens. So this function, when x is smaller than zero, y is always equal to three, so it's a horizontal line. When x is between zero and three, it's the function uh, y equals x. That's the that's the line, and this is this is happening when at the endpoints it's on this line as well, because it says smaller than or equal there. So if x is zero, if I'm trying to find f of zero, I have to look in the second line to see what it is, and finally. If um, if three if x is bigger than three, so if I'm here, this is a parabola, a parabola that goes through zero zero, and through one zero, and it's, it's positive, so it goes up. So, well, it looks something like this. Um, run out of the. You ran out of the page. So the, the question is, do these meet or don't they meet, basically, is what we're asking. <clears throat> so let's see. So like I said, I I have this limit. It's begging me to, to look at it from both sides. So the limit as x approaches three from the left. So if I'm approaching three from the left, that means that x is smaller than three, strictly smaller than three, uh, but x is close to three. So that means that 
the f of x is going to be found. So where are the x's that are, what is, where is 2.9 and 2.99? Where are those numbers in, in which of these rows do they fall? Well, 2.99 uh, 2 is more than three, but bigger than zero. The numbers that are close to three are all falling in this row. So that means that I can just use the function, use the formula y equals x for the function. So this limit is x, it's, it's three. Um, now, for the right-hand limit, so I'm approaching three from the right, that means that x is bigger than three. So if x is bigger than three, where in which of these rows am I? I'm I'm in the row where x is bigger than three. <clears throat> so, um, so the formula I can use here is uh, the second one. And again, using the power law or the addition law. So the limit, the limit of x is three, the limit of x squared is gonna be the square of that. The limit of the difference is gonna be the, the difference of the limits. In the end, it's gonna be three squared minus three, which is six. So, uh, so both limits exist, which is good. That's what we need for the limit uh, to exist, but the limits are not equal. So the limit we're looking for does not exist. And that's it. So this parabola turns out didn't match. It was going through y equals six. Um, it didn't match the graph at all. We were approaching one thing from the right and one thing from the left, and they were different. Does that make sense? Are there any questions? What questions are there? So, uh... Whatever, okay, so three from the left, you got a uh, limit of as, as x approaches three from the left, x, um, why wouldn't it, why wouldn't like three go there? Like, That's a good the question. Uh, the reason is that x is close to three. Um, and close means as close as you need. Uh, so, that means you can pick any number smaller than three, like two, and ignore everything smaller than two. So I'm trying to, so I have a function here, whatever it is, and here is x equals three. And I'm trying to look at the limit here. That means that to compute this limit, kind of like I was saying a couple of days ago, draw a circle and ignore everything outside of it. To compute this limit, to find out what happens as I get closer, I can I can ignore I can ignore all of this stuff. And if I wanted to ignore everything from here to the left, well, I could. Um, I can ignore. So let me write that down to find limit the limit from x approaching three to the left. I can ignore, I can ignore everything smaller than two if I want, or anything smaller than 2.9, or anything smaller than 2.99. Basically, any, you name the number smaller than three, you can ignore it. <laughs> 
you can ignore everything to the left of it. Um, because the only thing that matters is what happens when we're very close to three. Uh, so if I can ignore all of these numbers, I can ignore, um, I can ignore x more, uh, smaller than zero. So in, in computing this limit, in the end, turns out that this stuff over here played absolutely no role, didn't matter at all. It could have been anything. It could have been a function that we never heard of, that we don't understand at all. We didn't need to do absolutely anything with it. Because the only thing that matters is what happens when we're very close to three. Does that make sense? Yeah, so s since that's the case, that's why I would use like the, since uh, that part of the function zero um, is less than equal to x and all that, so then we would use that x then. Yeah, because if you think of numbers that are close to three from the left, like 2.9, they all, they, they're all here. So that's the one we have to use. All right, that makes sense, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Okay, so uh, moving on then. So um, this is um, kind of pretty different, still computing limits. So, oh, I'm bright and yellow now. Um, this is a completely different way to approach finding limits, uh, which is, um, so the first one is not that useful. Makes, I mean, kind of hard to use. The second one is very useful. Um, so we have two functions. It's kind of, I don't know, kind of stealing for, so if I have a function, if I have two functions and one is smaller than the other, for, I'm computing a limit, so it, what, uh, the only thing that matters is it was close to a particular point, like I was saying. But I don't care what happens at exactly the point because the limit doesn't care about that at all. So if I have a function that one function is smaller than the other, what do you think is going to happen to the limits? Uh, limit f of x would be smaller than or than limit g of x smaller than or equal to, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, if you think of if you think of two functions, um, if say that, that this is f of x, and let's say that this is g, and if g is smaller than f, oh, other way around. f is smaller than g. That means that the graph of f is below because the, the function is represented with the y coordinate. So smaller y coordinate means it's underneath. Um, what is, so, take this point, what is the function going to approach? Well, it's going to approach a bigger point um, than this one. With the important, important, not yet, um, provided that both limits exist, because if they don't exist, how am I going to say that one is smaller than the other? Okay, so that's um, one theorem, but this is the really interesting one. Uh, this is called the this is called the squeeze theorem in the book. I've always called it the sandwich theorem. Let me 
try and use the same letters as above of g and h. Okay. Um, so say we have three functions now. And they're in order. So g is in the middle. So, and then we have two, uh, three functions and we know the one, the small one and the big one both have limits. So the limit of f and the limit of h uh, both exist. And they are equal. Then, so this is what we need to use this theorem. If we have this, then what happens is that automatically the limit of G also exists. And it equals the other two. So that way, these are all things you can prove. Um, I mean, in the in the book, the next section explains precisely what a limit is, and then uses in the appendix, everything is proved. These are not things we're gonna do in this course, but if you're interested, I'm very happy to talk about it. It's really interesting. Um, so I think, but even if we don't prove it, I think a picture is pretty convincing. So I have two functions. I have a function f and I have a function h and h is, uh, no, h is bigger than f. And also I know that somewhere in here at x equals a, the two functions, they have the same limit. So h is approaching this point. f also has to approach this point. So it's gonna look something like this. So f is smaller than h, so it's below h, but they have the same limit at this point. So they have to look something like this. And now if I draw g, g is in between. So what the reason we call it the squeeze theorem is that G can do whatever it wants in here. It can do a lot of crazy stuff. But at, as we approach the point, it's squeezed between F and H because they're both approaching the same point. And whatever crazy stuff it does, it has to, it has to be crazy stuff that approaches the same point. Uh, so all three functions have all three functions approach the same point in the end. So this is useful when you have a function g that you think has a limit, but the algebra to do that is too complicated. But if you find bigger and smaller functions that are easier to deal with, uh, then you're in good shape. So let's do an example of that. I'm not gonna finish it, am I? Sad times. So this is a function that algebra has no hope of, of finding the limit to because it's just too complicated. Um, let me graph it. So sine of one over X, since one over X, oh, it's really zoomed in. Sine of one over x, uh, one over x gets really big, um, which means sine makes sine oscillate a lot. 
um, means that the function looks like this, but we multiply it by x squared, which is a pretty small number, the oscillation gets smaller and smaller. Um, so even though this function is kind of crazy, it still approaches something. Um, so we would like to show that this function approaches zero in three minutes, which I'm not going to manage. Um, but if only, if only I could find a function that fits in here, that is much easier than a function that fits in here and squeeze my nasty function in between these two. That would, that would be how I use a squeeze theorem. So, so what are these functions? Um, I'm going to grab them and hide them from you. See if I can. Can I? So that's what I'm looking for. Um, I mean, certainly a graphing calculator, it, it gives us ideas, but it doesn't really prove anything because computers lie to us all the time. So I should probably use algebra to find these two functions. So uh, the question is, uh, um, Can I find two functions to put in here? Hopefully they look easier. Uh, hopefully I can, uh, they have the same limit. Hopefully they have limit zero. So can I find these functions, which are easy to deal with. Okay, uh, I'm gonna have to finish that on Monday. Oh, it's too bad. Anyway, Monday, I'll finish that, and that means I'm finished 2.3. We can move on to continuity. All right, have a good weekend, um, which I mean, have a safe weekend. Uh, ask me your questions.